Hello YouTube. So a few days ago I uploaded a video introducing quasi-realism in metaethics and I figured I should uh, express some of my own thoughts on this, uh, why I'm not a quasi-realist. Um, so quasi-realism, as you'll be aware of if you saw that video, uh, it, it, it starts from a non-cognitivist position. So quasi-realists will say that moral judgments are expressions of attitudes or they're expressions of plans for action um, or something like that. You know, they're, they're expressions of non-cognitive states. But then the quasi-realist will try to show that from within that framework, we can still vindicate many of the ideas that are usually associated with realism. So although moral judgments are merely expressions of attitudes, um, we can still say that there is moral truth and that there are moral facts and that people have moral knowledge and that there is moral progress uh, and and so on, right? So all of these kind of realist sounding ideas can be vindicated uh, from wi within a non-cognitivist framework. So it's, you know, it's not exactly realism, it's quasi-realism. But yeah, so when somebody says like, slavery is wrong, um, that's an expression of like disapprobation towards slavery or it's a command not to enslave people um, or it's a you know commitment to a like plan to eradicate slavery or something like that right but um, so, so these sorts of things prima facie those aren't the sorts of things that can be like true or false right you know a sentiment an expression of attitude that's not something that can be true or false but quasi realists try to show that actually no it, it, it can um, and so the appeal of this is is obvious, right? Like quasi-realism is often presented as, you know, giving us the best of both worlds. Um, you know, we, we have the, uh, we have all of the kind of common sense ideas of realism, but, or what are often seen as being common sense ideas of realism, but, you know, without um, being committed to uh, any problematic epistemological or metaphysical claims. Um, so I, I remain a hardcore anti-realist. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, so one way in which I depart from at least standard quasi-realist is that I'm not really sure that I'm even a non-cognitivist. I have uh, uh, actually in the past expressed that I've that I changed my view from non-cognitivism to error theory. I, I find myself vacillating, right? Like I'm just, I'm not really sure anymore what the right account is. Um, so that's that's one point, right? Like I'm just not sure about the non-cognitivism. But like e even except even if I were to accept the non-cognitivism, I really could not get on board with uh, the rest of the quasi-realist project. Um, and I think part of this is, I mean, look, part of it is that I think that realism is just wrong. Okay, so. Um, Quasi-realists present this as the best of both worlds, but I really don't think that there is there is a you know best of the realist world because I just want to say realism is is simply mistaken, right? And I have no desire whatsoever to to kind of sugarcoat that or to to sort of tranquilize it. I mean that's that's one reason why I just don't really like quasi-realism is that when you read the early non-cognitivists, when you read people like uh, A.J. Ayer, you know, who first presented non-cognitivism, you know, he he was just, he just like embraced it. He just embraced the anti-realism. And that's what I want to see people do. I don't want to see people make concessions to realists. Um, <laughs> so, you know, because I, I think, I, I don't think realism is at all intuitive. I, I don't think realists have got good arguments. Um, I don't want to make concessions to them, right? So that's that's one point. Um, now, uh, I suppose getting on to the more philosophically substantive points. Uh, okay, one thing to bear in mind is that quasi-realism is like, it can be, it can be articulated in many different ways, right? So, you know, it's, it's very difficult to sort of give a, a general objection um, because there are many different ways of being a quasi-realist. So I just want to kind of acknowledge that like up front. But with that said, there are, I guess, some general tendencies. And one of them, as I talked about in the video, is that quasi-realists tend to be committed to deflationary approaches to truth. The obvious benefit of that way of thinking about truth in this context is if you're a deflationist, um, then you, I mean, you get truth pretty cheap, right? Uh, as long as moral 
judgments can be expressed using the sort of surface form of propositions, which obviously they can, right? Like people can say stuff, you know, you can say something like slavery is wrong and, uh, you, you know, or abortion is wrong or, you know, you ought not to do this or such and such ought not to be done, right? Like you, th these have like propositional surface form. As long as you've got that, then you can have moral truth because uh, to say that it is true that slavery is wrong that's equivalent to just saying slavery is wrong um, in, in some important sense, right? Like they're equivalent in meaning truth is not a substantive property. So um, this is one area where I have big problems because I just don't find deflationary theories of truth to be at all, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say at all, but I, I'm not convinced by them. Um, you know, there's, there's always seemed to me to be a really serious issue with deflationary theories. And I've never seen this issue addressed, but it, it's, it strikes me as being really obvious. And I don't quite understand why it's never been addressed. And I mean, it probably has been addressed, right? This is what I'm, this is what I'm saying. I, I think, I assume it must have been, it must have been discussed in the literature. But like, if you read the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy page on deflationism about truth, it doesn't talk about this problem, or at least it didn't when I last looked at it. Um, so the problem is that there are just loads and loads of situations in which we assert things that we take to be false, right? So, so on, according to the deflationary theory, the deflationary theory will tell you that um, to say that X is true, that's like just equivalent to saying X. Right. So you're, you're, you know, you're not like asserting anything more um, or, or at the very least. I mean, what they'll say is that like in any situation in which you can like sincerely assert X. Right. You can also that you'd also be able to sincerely assert X is true. And that just like, n no, of course not. I mean, um, just look at the use of idealizations in science, for example. I mean, I might assert that a star is composed of an ideal gas and, and not just assert it, but then like I might, you know, use that to construct a model or, you know, I might, I might sort of use this assertion uh, uh, in the context of engineering or something like that. You know, maybe we're engineering a probe to, I mean, uh, like when, I mean, we just sent a probe into the sun, right? So I don't know, maybe in the context of um, engineering that probe, you know, we had to model things as, as if they were composed of ideal gases, right? So, um, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll say these things, right? We'll, we'll make these assertions. Um, and, but we wouldn't want to say that's true, right? And it's, it's like, bear in mind, this isn't just something where, uh, where, where we're like saying that it's, it's approximately true, right? Like, I mean, an, an idealization is usually just false, right? So when, when we talk about ideal gases, it's not, a pro like that's not approximating reality. Um, and uh, like an ideal gas is is supposed to be you know consists of like dimensionless particles i mean obviously that's not approximating what we take reality to be so i mean no this is just false right but we will make these assertions we constantly we we, all, we very frequently assert things that are just false um and so i guess the 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 way you might account for that is to sort of shift the analysis onto the question of what counts as an assertion. So you might say, well, when I say that a star is composed of an ideal gas, I'm not really asserting it. Um, I don't know, but then, like, th then of course the big question just becomes, well, what is assertion? It's like all of the work that used to be, that we used to do with the concept of truth, we're now just doing with the concept of assertion. Right, so um, that hasn't that hasn't really helped. That's just kind of pushed the problem one step back. Um, you know, we don't really. We, what we would end up having is we'd have like a deflationary theory of truth, m maybe, but then we'd end up having this really robust theory of assertion. I guess is the point. Um, so, so yeah, I I just think that that this is one of the reasons why I I, I can't get on board. Um, with deflationism in general. Um, and again, you know, this is a really obvious point, so I guess it must have been addressed. And I, uh, so probably somebody in, in the comments will uh, direct me to, uh, <laughs> to where this has been addressed. And maybe I'm just, you know, revealing my uh, 
appalling ignorance of theories of truth in even making that criticism. But, you know, that's, that's where I am at the moment. Um, so I'm not a deflationist. And obviously that's a problem for uh, quasi-realism. Um, but then notice, so with, with quasi-realism, they don't just want to talk about moral truth. <clears throat> they also want like moral properties, moral facts. And what that means is they then will extend this deflationary theory to deflationary theories of facts and deflationary theories of properties, deflationary theories of, you know, other things. Um, and it starts to feel kind of like quite ad hoc at that point. Like it's, it's like the re like what the only reason why we're making these moves to these very controversial deflationary theories is so that we can like save realist intuitions, right? So we can save the idea of truth and facts and properties in the moral domain. Um, but, you know, I, I just think there has to, there's, there's something very unsatisfying about that. Um, like even from a realist point of view, because I guess what, so like what a realist is gonna say surely is well well no you know when i talk about truth and facts and properties and knowledge i mean all of that stuff in the robust sense you know when i say that it is true that slavery is wrong right i'm not, i don't mean like it is deflationary true that slavery is wrong i mean like this corresponds to a fact in the world right i'm i'm assuming the correspondence theory of truth um i guess i i worry that with that with quasi-realism there's maybe a danger of like equivocation or or maybe even a sort of Mott and Bailey type move where um I mean it's like this right suppose I say that I like physical books and you know it's like I, I, I like having I like having a book that I can you know hold and open the pages and you know I have a physical thing I say that that's something I like and so therefore um I'm not really into ebooks, right? Suppose I say that, and then somebody responds, um, well, you know, look, ebooks are physical books, right? After all, you know, we're all physicalists, right? Uh, we're all physicalists, aren't we? Ebooks are ultimately made of physical stuff, where they're made of matter. Um, I mean, you know, I've, I've got, there's something going on, like if I have an ebook on my computer, there's something going on in the, in the particles. <laughs> Uh, in the way they're interacting that's producing this and that's physical stuff so you know you've got you've got a physical book but of course that just um, you know that misses the point right um, you're just defining words uh, differently to me and um, you know it's, it's kind of the same when like a quasi realist talks about truth uh, can that be satisfying to a realist if you are introducing the deflationary theory of truth just in the moral domain, then I, I, th I think the answer would have to be no, because you know, you've got, so if you've got like a deflationary account of truth for moral truth, but you have some other account of truth for, you know, and like statements about external world objects, then it's, I mean, you're just talking, you're just talking about a different thing, right? Like, I think the realist could just say, well, you're not, you're not talking about truth anymore. On the other hand, if, if you, I, I guess, hold a deflationary theory of truth for all truths, um, then it becomes less clear what the distinction is. Um, like, I guess it becomes less clear at that point. Like, yeah, why, why we would uh, accept that moral claims can count as true, right? So then, then we get this problem where, well, look, even if you're a deflationist, you're gonna to have to find some way of accounting for the fact that we use, that we often say things that we take to be false, right? Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully that, that, made, that made sense. I think there's, you know, whenever I, I read quasi-realist literature, it always, feels to me and I, I don't want to I want to be careful how I say this because like I like a lot of the quasi realists you know like Simon Blackburn he's a great philosopher Simon Blackburn's wonderful but the quasi realist feels to me like a politician to be honest right <laughs> I mean 
you know, like a politician when they're interviewed about something and, you know, somebody's trying to get them to like say what their position is or to say what they're planning on doing and the politician will do everything they can. They'll, they'll, they'll weasel and whiffle and wobble around and to avoid like committing themselves. But that's what it feels like when I read quasi-realists, <laughs> right? When I read quasi-realists, it kind of feels like that. Um, uh, it's it's like when they talk about how they're able to get moral truth and moral facts and all of this um it's very frustrating for that reason uh when we start introducing new theories of truth uh in order to get that it's uh, yeah it's it's just annoying so um again this isn't really a, a maybe this isn't really a substantive point maybe this is just like a difference in how i prefer to approach philosophy, but um, <laughs> it, it feels like they're doing politics rather than doing philosophy. Um, okay, so putting aside uh, all of that stuff about uh, like deflationism and uh, versus correspondence theory and all of that, you know, there are, I think, other ways of getting to a kind of quasi-realism. And, and maybe this, this point is, uh, again, where I maybe this is where a, a real disagreement lies, right? So one way that we might think about what's going on with moral debate is that there's going to be some sort of convergence on uh, on values or convergence on rules. Like maybe it's the case that, you know, we can expect all humans to share relevantly similar fundamental values. Um, or maybe it's the case that if everybody was to like, kind of act in their purely rational self-interest, um, that they would all agree to the same set of rules or something like that. Um, so it could, it could be the case, right? Like we can, I, I guess we can imagine a society of people who are such that, w that you can expect universal agreement under certain conditions. Um, so that, you know, you can kind of say, well, if they were all ideally rational, then they would be able to achieve universal agreement on the rules by which to govern their society. Um, and that would give you a kind of realism. And I mean, like you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't have like realism in the sense of there being, you know, non-natural moral values out there, right? But there'd be universal agreement. And, you know, there'd be, I guess, moral progress insofar as people are, as, as that convergence happens, you could see that as a kind of progress. And, you know, you could maybe define moral truth in terms of the, uh, the rules that everybody is converging on, right? So um, is, that, is that like a robust realism? Well, not really, but maybe that's a kind of quasi-realism, right? Um, it would be maybe a bit like colour. So even if you're an anti-realist about colour, or even if you don't take colours to be you know, intrinsic properties of mind independent objects, right? Um, maybe you think that colors are like relational properties or something like that. There is basically universal agreement on color, or at least close enough. I mean, um, you, you know, there, there's slight differences in, in color perception. And obviously some people are colorblind, but like society has come to converge in their judgments on color and actually even people who are color blind are sort of roped into that you know um like a color blind person uh will still be able to like learn that some things are red and they maybe learn that like they could learn that like this cup is red even though they're not able to distinguish it from uh, things that we would call green so um so the point is is that yeah like you you, you might sort of take that kind of route to quasi-realism um and to that point, I just, I guess, reject that, right? Like, I <laughs> see no reason to expect this. I think that there are very, that, well, yeah, I, I think that there's certainly no reason to assume that, you know, as people become increasingly rational or like, as people are ideally rational, they will all come to agree on the same values or the same rules. In fact, I think it, there's, uh, I mean, just almost limitless possibilities for difference here. I think, I think that a, a, a perfectly rational being could have pretty much any values at all. Um, so, you know, it's, it seems to me entirely possible that somebody could be 
perfectly rational, um, but then, as Hume says, you prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of their finger. Right? It is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of my finger. Um, as it happens, most humans do seem to share enough of their basic values that we can come to agreements that kind of work, but, you know, <laughs> there are, there are, there are, there are always outliers, and um, I don't really see us kind of converging in any particular direction uh, in the long run. Um, so yeah, I, I guess those are the those are the main issues that I have with quasi realism, um, and I think a final point that I would want to make is that it's not always obvious to me what it is that quasi-realists are sort of trying to uh, to describe, or what it is that they're trying to do. So, so the, the idea obviously is to um, capture realist intuitions, right? Like they, they want to accommodate realist intuitions. But, um, so like think, think about uh, uh, an example like this, right? Um, they'll take a statement such as, uh, if we didn't disapprove of slavery, slavery would still be wrong, right? And so a quasi-realist will want to say um, that statement is true, right? Even from a non-cognitivist point of view. Now, from a non-cognitivist point of view, you might say, well, how could that? How could a statement like that be true? Um, it, you know, because moral judgments just are expressions of our attitudes. Um, but quasi-realists have got these rather clever ways of. Uh, showing that actually that kind of statement can be true. So the idea of like moral moral truths being mind independent or attitude independent, that can be saved on quasi-realism. And so we, we can have statements like, it is a mind independent fact that st slavery is wrong, or if we didn't disapprove of slavery, slavery would still be wrong. Um, I, I talk in the, in the uh, earlier video a bit about how quasi-realists think this is supposed to work. Um, but then I, I just think, okay, so with, Cases like this, right, what exactly is it that we're really trying to vindicate? Um, so if we think about ordinary practices, uh, just the ordinary moral discourse that laypersons engage in, I guess people will use claims like, you know, truth and knowledge. You know, somebody will say, like, it's true that slavery is wrong, or, or maybe somebody might make a moral judgment and then someone else might say, oh, yeah, that's true. Um, and so maybe people do talk in terms of truth and knowledge. So if, if you're trying to, you know, vindicate ordinary moral discourse, um, you know, okay, maybe you want to try to capture truth and knowledge. I, I kind of get that. But when it comes to claims like, you know, it is a mind independent fact that slavery is wrong, or if we didn't disapprove of slavery, slavery would still be wrong. When it comes to stuff like that, I mean, I don't think laypersons ever say stuff like that. I've never heard that, at least, uh, at, like outside of philosophy, right? I, I mean, I genuinely don't think I've ever engaged in a in a moral debate with somebody where they have said statements like that. Um, you know, this seems to be something that just occurs in philosophy. Um, so it, it could be then, well, maybe we're trying to account not for ordinary discourse, maybe we're trying to account for philosophical discourse, maybe we're trying to um, vindicate the sort of statements that philosophers make. But the problem then is that as an account of philosophical discourse, it's just obviously false, right? Because when a philosopher says something like, it is a mind independent fact that slavery is wrong, they will tell you explicitly, they're not just expressing attitudes, right? Uh, that's not what they're doing. Um, so, 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 what's the point of this account, right? It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't seem to make any sense as an account of what's of what laypersons are doing because laypersons don't use this language; they don't talk in those kinds of ways. If it's supposed to be an account of what philosophers are doing, uh, then it just seems to be clearly false because I mean, like you can. You can just, I mean, you can just ask them. I mean, philosophers will tell you. Philosophers are, usually have explicit commitments to metaethical theories, and the kind of philosophers 
who will say things like, you know, it's a mind independent fact that something is wrong. Those philosophers are going to have an explicit commitment to a cognitivist realist metaethical theory. Um, and I, I mean, if you were to give a vindication of that, like if you were to vindicate a cognitivist realist metaethics, then you would just be a realist, surely. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that this is this is a big problem as well. And actually, this kind of thing, I think, is a problem not just for quasi-realism, but for a lot of the uh, for, for a lot of the kind of semantic theories that are um, that that quasi-realists have given and that other non-cognitivists have given. I mean, I guess this will come up a bit when cause I haven't done the video yet, but I'm planning on doing a video on the frege geech problem, um, which is super technical. But I'll just say now uh, that one of the big issues with this um, is that it just, the, the, the kinds of accounts that are given, um, it's not really clear like like what the point is i mean so 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 here's here's an example of how this works right um non cognitivists struggle because they they struggle with the fact that we can embed moral judgments in longer sentences so people don't just say things like torture is wrong right they'll say something like if torture is wrong, then paying somebody to torture is wrong. And the problem from a non-cognitivist point of view is that when you say, if torture is wrong, then paying somebody to torture is wrong, you're not, like, you're not actually expressing anything about torture, right? That's not a, because that, that's not a moral judgment, right? Like, if torture is wrong, then paying somebody to torture is wrong. That torture is wrong, that's not something you're asserting. So. You might, you might actually be okay with torture. Somebody could be perfectly fine with torture and then still say that, you know? So I, I might be, I might endorse torture. I might think that torture is perfectly cool, but then I might still say, oh yeah, but if torture is wrong, then paying somebody to torture would be wrong. Um, you know, it, it, it's possible to hold those, those, kinds of, those kinds of views, right? So, I mean, so I, I can say like, uh, I don't know, um, <laughs> if, um, like, if gay sex is wrong, then paying someone to engage in gay sex is wrong, right? Like, I might endorse that, even though obviously I don't have a problem with gay sex, right? So, um, the issue then is, if moral judgments are just expressions of attitude, right, what are we doing when we say something, when we have these kinds of conditional claims, or when we embed a moral judgment in a, in a longer sentence? Or if I say something like, you know, I wonder whether torture is wrong, or Frank believes that torture is wrong, right? In that case, we're embedding it in a longer sentence. And so it can, it's, it's not expressing an attitude, right? So that's a big problem. It's a big problem for non-cognitivists. And they have come up with all of these very sophisticated semantic theories to, um, to account for this, to explain this. Um, but again, it's like, so, so here's, here's an example of, of one of these. One of the things that Simon Blackburn says, he doesn't endorse this anymore, but he did once endorse it, is what's known as the higher order attitudes account. And on this account, when I say, if X is wrong, then Y is wrong, what I'm doing is, the way to understand this, the semantics of this is, right, I'm expressing a negative attitude to the combination of a negative attitude to x and uh, the absence of a negative attitude to y, right? Does that make sense? I mean, I know this is this is really this is really complicated. <laughs> I know. Um, maybe it doesn't matter. The, the point is, right? Like, so so when I say you know if x is wrong, then y is wrong. That's expressing um, a negative attitude to the combination of a negative attitude to x and the absence of a negative attitude to y, right? So. Again, it's complicated, but the, I mean, the, like the the point is, it's like, well, what, like, what what is this exactly? Because it, surely, I mean, is that supposed to be a psychological thesis? Um, because it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem 
to be true for people's psychologies, right? I mean, when you in certainly when you encounter this, it just seems completely weird. Uh, I mean, maybe it is true for people's psychologies. Maybe that is what's going on, but it, it surely would require a lot of empirical evidence to, uh, to establish that. I mean, I'm not sure what that empirical evidence would look like. Um, so, you know, I, I, and, and I mean, that's just one example, but you get this in, in like a lot of this literature and I mean much of the much of the quasi realist literature is uh, part of this tradition of responses to the Frege Geach problem where it just seems to be kind of it, it seems like we're just kind of constructing these semantic theories um, where it's like uh, what is what is the point of this like what are we like what? What are we doing? Is is this? Is is it a description of people's psychologies? Because that seems it seems very implausible. I mean, certainly there's no actual there's no actual evidence for this. Um, what else could it be? I mean, maybe we're engaging in a kind of conceptual engineering, right? So maybe it is literally just like a vindication, right? Maybe, but but then. It just seems if we're going to do conceptual engineering, it seems like there are much easier options. Like, why wouldn't you just be a fictionalist or something, you know? Um, why would you construct these, like, really elaborate theories about, like, expressions of attitudes and attitudes towards attitudes? I and mean, why, not, why not just, yeah, why not just be a fictionalist? Just take moral statements at face value, like the, you know, like the error theorist does, and just say, you know, okay, they're false, but then we can understand them as useful fictions or something like that. Um, that seems a lot simpler, <laughs> you know? Um, I guess that, uh, you know, this is something that uh, I, I has come up uh, in the discussion that I had with, with Lance Bush, which is worth checking out. Um, I think that the, the sort of view that I have now is that there are, there are two ways that you can look at moral discourse, right? So one perspective we can take on it is... I guess it's just like look at the the linguistics, right? Like we can we can set we can give this problem to the linguists, and we can talk about like the grammar and the syntax and the use of these statements in practice. Um, and of course, from from that point of view, when somebody makes a moral statement, if they say something like slavery is wrong, well, you know that's that's like a descriptive sentence, right? Like that's just how it seems at face value. Um, then the other thing we can do is we can do psychology and we can ask like, what are people trying to do? What are they trying to express? What do they take themselves to mean? And maybe there are plenty of people who, when they say things like slavery is wrong, maybe they are trying to express attitudes, right? Maybe that's what they're doing. Um, but here's the thing, once, once you've like, answered both of those questions, what more work is there to do? Um, you know, what, what, what contribution do meta-ethicists have once you've, once you've got answers to those empirical questions? Um, what further work is there to do? It seems like the only thing is some sort of conceptual engineering, right? Is it may be the case that, well, moral discourse is kind of vague and confused and, um, you know, we, we want to fix it, right? And, um, and, and not just that, you know, we want to give an account of moral discourse that makes sense, um, maybe not just of what, like, lay people are doing, but what philosophers are doing. When philosophers make moral arguments, um, we need to give uh, a vindication of that or something, right? Like, we, we need to give an account of it that at least makes it coherent. Um, but it seems then that from that point of view, I, I just don't see uh, these kind of sophisticated quasi-realist accounts, although they're very interesting, perhaps, <laughs> for their own sake. Um, it just seems like there are better, better options available in terms of, you know, simplicity and ease of applicability. Um, I just, I, I, like, I don't know who we're talking to when we come up with these really complex semantic accounts about expressions of attitudes towards attitudes and so on. I mean, 
aren't there easier options? Um, okay, how long have I been talking? Oh, wow, like 34 minutes. Well, um, I'm not really sure how much sense all of that made, but uh, hopefully that gave you some idea of, of why I'm not a quasi-realist.